Okay, well, welcome, Dara Nasamoglu and Peter Turchin. I am so happy to be talking with you today. This conversation is uh, part of a project called The Science of the Noosphere. That term was coined by Tehard de Chardin uh, to refer to mental, a mental dimension to human society. And Tehard observed that in some ways we're just another ape species, but in other ways we're a new evolutionary process, cultural evolution, making the origin of our own species as significant in its own way as the origin of life. And he describes small-scale society as tiny grains of thought, which diversified, but also coalesced into larger and larger units. And extrapolating into the future, he envisioned the entire Earth as a kind of superorganism with a global consciousness. And so that's the kind of the framing for today's talk. Both of you are highly qualified to comment on the expanding scale of human society from a modern scientific perspective, but you come from very different disciplinary backgrounds. And so I think of this conversation as a coalescence of academic cultures as part of the coalescence that's needed uh, more, more generally. And so I'd like to begin, um, if we may, with having each of you describe your academic backgrounds that brought you to the study of this subject. Uh, Darren, beginning with you, what is your academic background that, um, that kind of uh, forms the, the basis of your approach? Thank you, David, and uh, hi, Peter. It's, uh, it's great to be here. Thanks for inviting me to be part of this conversation, David. I am an economist by training, and uh, uh, a lot of my research has been on institutional foundations of long-run economic growth, prosperity, poverty, and also, by implication, understanding the dynamics of institutions. For example, you know, democracy, that seems such an amazing innovation in terms of how human affairs are organized, where it comes from, when it works, when it doesn't work. So those were the questions that, you know, I have that sort of that motivated me for much of my career. But over the last few years, even more closely related to the subject matter, I'm also thinking about how we have evolved from the small hunter gatherer forager days to building institutions for large scale cooperation and conflict and uh, and what are the feasible limits of that cooperation in what ways we can get that cooperation without getting all of the conflict and the carnage that it has produced over centuries so i think uh, you know having this conversation with you david and with you peter is is really an important milestone for me oh, that's great and darren could you say more about the <clears throat> the of uh, the tradition of the what I call the new institutional economics, as I understand it, associated with Douglas North, how when it arose, I, my understanding is it arose in the 1970s, and kind of in reaction to neoclassical economics, which had nothing to say about institutions, and it was disenchantment with with that school of economic thought that led to this institutional focus. But you know more about it than I do, so let's hear about it from from an expert. Yeah, I mean, I think from the beginning, if you look at the classic economists, uh, you know, institutions did play an important role in their thinking. It wasn't just neoclassical sort of reasoning about supply and demand and prices, but, you know, early stages of the economic disciplines evolution, of course, focused on the simpler problems. It's what uh, the economist Abe Lerner uh, sort of said uh, uh, economics became the queen of social sciences by focusing on solved political problems. So politics was left in the background. And I think uh, many uh, scholars have tried to sort of bring that in one way or another. Thorsten Weblin uh, was an early uh, proponent of that. Polanyi, uh, Karl Polanyi, although not as an economist in some ways, more as a political scientist or a sociologist and, 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 and Douglas North, and, and many of his followers. And uh, and I think there are uh, pluses and minuses to each approach. Uh, Douglas North, in some sense, was most compatible with neoclassical economics because he sort of tried to incorporate it. My thinking is uh, that, in fact, there are many aspects of the economics discipline that are very powerful, both uh, as an empirical approach and as a conceptual 
framework, but missing in that framework is the role of power, social power, uh, and how that power is organized. Institutions is one part of it. Cooperation is another dimension. Conflict is another dimension. And I think uh, what I have tried to do, again, complementary to what Douglas North has achieved, is 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 bring power in, in its various uh, ramifications uh, into the economic and political discussion. That's great. And another conversation in this series is with uh, Josiah Ober on Greek democracy, so um, which was a wonderful conversation uh, um, that's part of this um, um, a series. So, Peter, now over to you. And, and could I ask you to begin with your father, who is a, a major figure in the development of Tehardian uh, thoughts, or first your father and then you. Thank you, David, for inviting me to this uh, conversation, and nice to meet you, Darren. Uh, I've been admiring your book, uh, books and uh, articles for a long time. Yes, well, um, starting with my father uh, is quite appropriate because he was, uh, uh, he always mentioned that he considered himself as, as a dis disciple of T.R. de Chardin. In fact, um, he admired his book, The Phenomenon of Man, uh, greatly, and he, in fact, styled uh, his most important philosophical book after Teilhard's book, uh, because my father's book, the, the, um, the major book was called The Phenomenon of Science, all right? So um, my father actually was, uh, a tra by training, a, um, a theoretical physicist, but then he switched um, in mid-career to do more uh, what uh, he called cybernetics. So computer science, but also uh, math uh, uh, mathematics, uh, that new, new type of mathematics where he contributed quite uh, a lot. And, um, um, and he was uh, very interested in applying the ideas of cybernetics to human societies, actually to, uh, uh, to both uh, science as phenomenon science, uh, 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 the title of his book says, but also he wrote later a book called The Inertia of Fear, uh, which actually got him into very uh, big trouble in the Soviet Union. Remember, this was all before the Soviet Union collapsed. And uh, there he was extending his ideas to, um, to society. So let me just run a little bit ahead and say that uh, several of his ideas I found extremely productive. So when we start talking, he actually has a whole chapter about multi-level cultural selection, although he does not call it that way because he wrote the book in 1970s before this concept was even, uh, I think, uh, caught. Peter, let me break in with these timelines here, you know, 1970s, 1980s, so on. So the 1970s, when people like Douglas North were working, that was the dark age in evolutionary theory as far as group selection was concerned. It was thoroughly rejected, would not be revived until uh, until later. And so really evolution had uh, very little to contribute to this topic until it itself became multi-level, um, 1990s, 2000s, so on and uh, so on and so forth. So that's the extent to which things are coming together. And when your father then uh, anticipated multi-level selection, that was that was on his own, basically. That was he, was, he wasn't getting that from, from uh, evolutionary theory. Yeah, and he was coming to these ideas from a very different direction than uh, biological evolutionists. Yeah, so continue. Yeah, so he was thinking about how do uh, complex organisms arise and how do complex societies arise. And so he, was, uh, he proposed um, a model of really, um, of first multiplication of units. So think about, uh, you know, an annelid worm, right? Your annelid worm has many segments. So in my father's thinking was that this was a general uh, mode of uh, evolution from simple to complex things is that first you get multiplication of units. So each segment is the same, but then once you have, uh, 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 you know, once that multi-segmentary uh, organism has ar arose, has arisen, um, then you can see evolution pushing for specialization of different segments that do different things. So one segment, becomes the head and starts to 
uh, can control other things, others, uh, uh, you know, specialize in something else. And um, very soon you have um, an organism in which you don't, if you look at it, you won't even see the segments, all right? Because they have evolved uh, to have to bear different functions and it's all integrated. And so that is uh, really um, um, very close to what multi-level uh, selection uh, later on um, has uh, proposed. And I'm here, I am referring to the um, books by uh, John Maynard Smith and Ersh uh, Satmary. Uh, so uh, they uh, basically were talking about major evolutionary transitions. And that was later after my father, but of course- and, uh, they, uh, Yeah, and uh, Peter, again, uh, we're featuring major evolutionary transitions, including Ersh Satmary um, as part of this series. Our series begins with the origin of life and major biological transitions before getting to human origins and major cultural transition. That's the sweep of our series. So anyhow, continue, please. No, um, I think that's, um, unless you have a questions about um, my father's approach, which I'm happy to answer, but I think I, I think I got the gist of it. Oh yeah, now to you. So, so your trajectory basically, and uh, which I love, I know it well. Uh, basically you're here today because of the midlife crisis is the way I remember it. <laughs> well, uh, that's, uh, that's true. I always wanted to be a scientist and follow uh, in my father's uh, footsteps. Uh, and, but, and so um, when I started um, uh, in college and then graduate school, I was really fascinated by theoretical biology and that's what I was trained as. So I uh, was um, uh, I applied uh, the tools of um, uh, uh, statistical analysis and mathematical modeling to such questions as uh, the uh, nonlinear dynamics of animal populations, both in time and in space. So, for example, congregation of animals and uh, you know proto let's say proto societies that they could actually form. And as you say, yes, um, when I, I hit 40 years old and, uh, and I thought uh, at that point I, uh, that basically um, the big question I was working uh, until that point was why do populations of animals go through cycles and chaos? Um, and um, we saw basically the outlines of the answer. It took me a few more years to publish a book called Complex Population Dynamics, where I basically put everything I knew about it. But at that point, I wanted to have a challenge. And so uh, instead of uh, divorcing my wife uh, and uh, marrying graduate student, I divorced uh, biology and married uh, social sciences, basically. <laughs> And so you came up with what you call Clio dynamics. So initially, um, initially this was a hobby um, because I was thinking uh, back to um, such uh, giants of population dynamics as Alfred Lotka and Vita Volterra, who in the 1920s really um, overturned the study of population dynamics because they showed that you can get population cycles without external drivers. That was the uh, idea that first ecologists like Charles Elton, for example, uh, thought that the reason we see cycles is because environment changes. But um, uh, Volterra and Lotka showed mathematically that cycles can arise endogenously as a result of population interactions. And so I was thinking at first, well, let's try to apply some, you know, just create some simple mathematical models of uh, societies, their dynamics and evolution. Um, and I started doing that, but because um, um, I've always been working at the interface between theory and data, I could not stop at just making models. I wanted to see what the data could tell us. And I was uh, really surprised because I found that in fact, there's huge amounts of data about historical societies that archeologists and historians have gathered. So, and that basically started me on this uh, path of uh, of uh, both uh, proposing um, uh, both translating uh, verbal theories into mathematical models, deriving predictions from them, and then building uh, large databases of historical information to test those uh, hypotheses. Yeah, and I think this theme of academic coalescing, Teilhard's theme of coalescence, and then the theme of academic coalescence is really an important to consider and to get these timelines. For example, 
the study of complexity, which was basically began with people like your father, uh, couldn't really develop without the advent of widespread computing. So that takes us into the 1970s, 80s, 90s. Um, and now the study of history, when you entered it, um, I mean, there had been grand theories of history in the past, and most of them had failed, were too simplistic. And at the time that you entered it, the idea of history as a quantitative science was very new and marginal, as, as, I, as I understand it. And so, and so uh, a little bit about, about your approach, how that interacted with uh, historians, basically, as they, as they did their work. Well, it's still uh, somewhat uh, marginal as far as the historians are concerned. Um, the, uh, the discipline actually has been uh, having quite a lot of resonance among social scientists. So historical, um, you know, uh, so, uh, sociologists, economic historians, um, uh, anthropologists and archaeologists. And so this is where, um, you know, uh, we get the most support. We launched a journal called Cleodynamics, uh, uh, the Journal of Quantitative History and Cultural Evolution. Cultural evolutionists, of course, are a major um, uh, source of both inspiration and support. And so most of the um, um, researchers active in this field, they, they are social scientists. However, um, and I knew from the, when we started that it would be hard to get, uh, you know, that historians would, many historians would be not very happy about um, natural scientists, so, uh, you know, inv invading their turf. Um, and that, now, why, Peter? Why? Just a minute, just dwell a little bit. Why? Well, um, uh, first of all, uh, histori uh, the, the way that um, history and social science uh, um, are divided in the Anglo uh, foreign countries is that history, the history, the history, his history is considered as a um, as a humanity. It's not a science. And so most historians, they don't really care about uh, history science because they don't care about testing theories, for example. So, of course, they do um, when they explain things. Anytime a historian writes some kind of narrative, they sneak uh, some explanatory theories into, into it. All right. But um, uh, typically what happens is that um, uh, we have accumulation of explanations. So uh, I, love, I love to cite this one German historian, Alexander Demand, who uh, in 1984 published a book where he counted 230 uh, uh, hypotheses, explanations of why Roman Empire collapsed, for example. And since then, there has been a couple dozen more. So the, uh, um, the explanations multiply, but there is no mechanism, which is key to science, which means rejecting some hypothesis in favor. Of others, and so that's um, um, uh, that's that's one of the reasons. But the other reason is that uh, historians. That I would say three reasons. The first one because the historians are not scientists. Second uh, is uh, because um, most historians love the detail, the glorious detail, and the differences between societies. Um, and and I actually love that too, but they think that that's all there should be. There, there's, there are no general principles. And, um, and the third one is that most historians have not bothered to read any of the, um, you know, articles or books that we say. And so most of the reactions I see on Twitter is when there is some kind of popular article uh, talking about cleodynamics. That's all that particular historian reads. And then they basically spew their <laughs> venom on uh, Twitter and saying how this is so horrible and so on and so forth. I remember the first time I... Uh invited you to our campus to uh, give a talk. Uh, we have a very highly regarded Egyptologist who came to your talk and then at the end stormed out of the room with a disgusted look on his face. Mm -hmm. And so that was kind of said it, uh, well, well, now- But thank let me you. just add one thing. <laughs> let me just add one more thing. Actually, but um, I should end this by saying that the reception among historians actually exceeded my wildest expectations because a very substantial minority have taken it up. So, for example, if we have a chance to talk about the Seshat data bank, um, that uh, that thing is impossible to do without historians and other scholars of the past. So we have 
Um, we have more than a hundred historians who have been supporting us by volunteering their knowledge and expertise. So a substantial minority and growing, by the way, is um, has been uh, become very good colleagues. Yeah, and this is the time to mention, Seishat, that basically what you're doing and always have done has two components, as with your biological work. There's a theoretical dimension and there's an empirical dimension. And now with Seishat, uh, well, you can say it, but basically it's the assemblage of a worldwide historical database that you kind of liken to the Human Genome Project. So so uh, a little mm -hmm. bit more and then we'll launch into our, our uh, past, present and future stage of this conversation. Sure, uh, just, uh, just a few brief words that when I um, started actually reading more history and reading more historical research, I was basically flabbergasted by how much is actually known about. I mean, yes, there are lots of lacunas and there are gaps in our knowledge, but there is also a huge amount of information. And furthermore, it grows very rapidly, partly as a result of new technologies, uh, such as, for example, in, uh, in archaeology, we have uh, all kinds of new techniques, but also historians are coming up with new ways to interpret historical records. And of course, uh, digital humanities, specifically digital hu history, it has been a great way to organize data. So basically our job was to take that knowledge and translate that into data that could be analyzable. And that turned out to be quite possible. And so that's why uh, we now uh, have uh, just uh, the whole batch of articles that are analyzing the uh, 2020 uh, data release uh, from Seshat. Lots of great results, very interesting results. And so it, this is, after 10 years of hard work, uh, and uh, the first uh, five or six years were really uh, hard uh, because, uh, you know, it was, it's, it's a huge amount of work. Uh, and it also took a huge amount of uh, money, resources uh, from the funders to, um, to affect it. But now we are at the sweet spot where we can see the fruits of this uh, labor. Okay, so Darren, you want to comment on any of this before we segue to the next uh, past, present, uh, future stage? I know you yourself and um... no, no. I mean, I think I think I don't have anything to add. Peter gave a very nice uh, summary of of his father's work and his work, and I'm I'm a big fan. I think uh, quantitative methods uh, have a huge role in helping us understand the past and understand the social forces at work. Uh, I think that I have some different emphases on some of the details and, and different, somewhat different approaches complementary to Peter's, but we'll probably talk about some of those as we, as we go along. And I know Darren that you also integrate models with data in your work. So in this respect, we are on the same, uh, yeah, fellow travelers. Knowing both of your work well, I see tremendous continuity. And and uh, and why nations fail? Your great book, Darren, begins historically with the colonization of the New World, and uh, just amazing stories about uh, that, which I'll return to, and I'll raise some of those points myself. So what I want to do now is to is to three segments: past, present, future, and to have uh, Peter, you um, lead the first segment. Let's cover Tehard's ground from the origin of our uh, species in very small scale societies, tiny grains of thought, as he put it, gradually increasing to the nations of today coming into Darren's territory. But of course he would think of it, and it is over the long term an increase in scale, but you describe something called the Z-shaped curve. Uh, but tell us more in detail of what science currently tells us about the uh, last 10,000 years of human history, which led to a net increase in scale. Everyone knows that. But the dynamics, basically, that were responsible for that and was actually described more of a zigzagging process than, than just a linear process. Well, um, first of all, um, uh, yes, in the last, uh, in, during the Holocene, basically the last 10,000, 10, 11,000 years, the um, scale of human society has grown by an astronomic um, six or seven orders of magnitude. So from societies of hundreds, maybe a few thousands, we now have uh, hundreds of millions and even billions, all right? So that is, um, uh, it, it's a basic social fact of uh, social science 
that really begs for uh, explanation. But this, um, this um, mm, change was, first of all, not gradual. So right now, um, uh, we are uh, about to finish an article where we show that, in fact, it was much more like punctuated equilibrium. You have uh, uh, periods of rapid uh, change and then um, long periods of uh, apparent stagnation and things like that. So, so even um, that, uh, and of course, there are many, um, you know, for every two steps forward, there are a step back. So you have empires rise, but they also fall and collapse. Uh, so so that, that is one thing. But um, the other thing is that um, during this um, process, um, there may, some other things, um, some other aspects of human experience have been actually have gone on quite a roller coaster. So we can talk about um, equality. We can also talk about well-being, all right? Uh, so we can talk about warfare and all those uh, uh, things have gone in very interesting and completely nonlinear uh, fashion. So the well-being, for example, the first uh, first urbanized societies uh, who are based on Neolithic, Neolithic uh, agriculture, they um, they were extremely unhealthy people. So the well-being really collapsed. And then we see uh, we can trace the well-being by let's say the average stature. And we see uh, cycles, basically. Uh, you know, sometimes uh, the the, popula the average population height is a very sensitive um, measure of biological uh, quality of life. Now, let me just flag that, see, Peter. Uh, let me just flag that because it's something I love about your work. People ask, "How do we know this? How can we know this?" Well, body height will tell you a whole bunch. <laughs> how, exactly. How big and you you have the two million skeletons. Yeah, there are two million skeletons in European museums uh, spanning the last uh, several thousand years. And, um, you know, um, an, uh, anthrop um, econometric, no, um, anthropometrics, I guess, that's the, the name of the discipline. They've been uh, processing this data. This is one of the examples of where we get really wonderful uh, dynamical data on, um, on the past. But in terms of um, um, uh, inequality, so we, you you have been already you you have already brought up the issue of democracy. Well, um, um, the best we know, of course, we could we cannot travel back into the Pleistocene and uh, observe people there. But to the best of our knowledge, they were quite democratic. Uh, not everywhere there were some uh, societies that were, that had inequalities, but uh, they were much more egalitarian than what came after them. And so what happened was that, especially the first centralized societies, complex chiefdoms and archaic states, they were pretty horrible places to live, uh, even for kings. The kings were, were assassinated all the time. I mean, we have, we are, we have been gathering data on uh, the probability of a ruler to be uh, deposed or killed, and we can actually quantify these types of things. And of course, 90% uh, of the population was living in abject poverty, was uh, completely at the whim of the elites and rulers, and uh, they were sacrificed, um, uh, you know, which to me is human sacrifice is sort of the ultimate uh, indignity and uh, inequality. But also we can see the huge differences in heights between nobles and uh, peasants and so on and so forth. And so then something happened and uh, we started on our road uh, to more democratic, more uh, egalitarian, but by no means we got anywhere near to the egalitarianism that we see in the Pleistocene, because still, uh, even in the democratic societies, uh, we have huge disparities of wealth, all right? But at least um, we, uh, it's not as bad as, being, as living in a, an archaic uh, despotic state. Uh, uh, certainly, democracy has uh, helped to counteract that move. So that's why we see, we call it Z-curve, so um, our uh, five million years ago, our um, great ape ancestors, they were quite despotic. They had uh, what's known social hierarchies. Um, so in the chimps, uh, in the chimp populations, one, there's one uh, uh, person, uh, uh, one uh, uh, person, that's what we call that person, uh, alpha male who beats up everybody. There's a beta male who beats everybody, but alpha male and so on. And then the alpha female she is beaten by all the males but she beats the, all the females uh, be, be, uh, below her. So it's a very strict uh, social hierarchy and it's uh, 
uh, violently uh, maintained all the time. So that's very different from what happened to uh, to our to, to Homo sapiens, uh, even um, the Homo genus, uh, starting with uh, the two, two million pause, years ago. Uh, uh, Peter, let me uh, let me pause there uh, for a minute, in part because uh, uh, Darren, you're uh, uh, you begin with hunter-gatherer societies in South America encountered by the, um, uh, they were egalitarian. So the, the egalitarianism of small-scale societies, what I want to emphasize is the importance of social control, that the reason that small-scale societies are egalitarian is because they can effectively control bullies. And so the, uh, this is what Christopher Bohm calls reverse dominance, basically. Um, there's plenty of people that want to boss others around, but they can't because they can be collectively controlled. And so social control, back to power, really, is, um, is what makes small scale societies past and present uh, because our, our series is covering current indigenous societies. So it's quite interesting. Um, uh, egalitarian. And then course, when, when the scale of society grew, thanks to agriculture and so on, basically it resulted in power imbalances. And now you have your despotic um, environment. So it really does come down to power, as I think we're going to elaborate in the present day. And Darren, you've already, already uh, indicated that that's where we're going. Thanks, for Dave. Thanks, David. I mean, I think uh, to me, what's really amazing is the diversity of social organizations that humans have created over the ages. You know, if you look at uh, all the other species I know about, and I think uh, the two of you know more about more of them, but they, they have very constricted ways of dealing with social and environmental problems. Humans have demonstrated a tremendous range of ways of dealing with problems. And I think that is why institutions are so important because institutions are the ways that we create for dealing with each other and we dealing with these problems. And at the root of it, like you, David, I think Christopher Bohm's ideas of reverse dominance hierarchies versus you know, the more alpha male hierarchies, that the interaction of these two, I think is quite foundational here. You know, if we, if anybody who looks at human history cannot be but struck by the ability of our kin to live under extremely hierarchical institutions, and at the same time, defend egalitarianism very vigorously. So it's sort of self-contradictory, and the, the way that we resolve that self-contradiction in some sense is by building different sets of institutions, and sometimes those institutions bring out the hierarchy aspect, sometimes they suppress that hierarchy. And of course, and I think Peter's work is very relevant here, demographic, economic, and uh, social circumstances are very important for that. You know, it's no surprise in some sense that maintaining that egalitarian ethos is much harder once you can accumulate assets and once you have to engage in much more systematic much larger scale wars although there are examples of uh, many uh, tribal societies including the germanic ones and the mongolian ones that you know increase the degree of hierarchy in society during war times and then reduce it thereafter so there are ways of dealing with war that may not be completely despotic and hierarchical as well. But but obviously, the ability to accumulate assets, which takes a big leap, one of the punctuated equilibrium, I like that very much as Peter does, uh, together with settled life, you know, the ability of hunter gatherers and foragers to accumulate assets was extremely limited. Once you have settlements, that changes, that's going to complicate matters. It opens up a whole host of possibilities. And to me, again, I guess this is one place, there's a lot of overlap between what Peter has talked and my thinking here. In fact, probably I agree with 99.9% .9 of what he's said uh, so far. But that's where 
I guess one place where we might start departing is I think that confronted with the same challenges, different human groups are going to come up with different solutions. So the solutions that say, for example, you mentioned Joshua Ober's work or Josh Ober's work, which is fantastic. And I'm very happy that he has featured in this program as well. You know, if you just look at very similar conditions of, you know, uh, 2,600, 2,700 years ago in the Greek peninsula, well, the solutions that, uh, you know, Spartans have come up with solving these problems is extremely different than those of Macedonians. And that is extremely difficult, different again from the when the Athenians. And then go just a couple of thousands of miles to the east and the ones of Persians come up with, it's completely different as well. And I think that institutional diversity is what a lot of social science is about. And it's truly fascinating. And, and, and one of the reasons why I think this sort of quantitative history is so difficult is because of that diversity. So I depart, for example, from, you know, the more common explanations that see some sort of environmental factors as almost defining. And when you transition to agriculture, uh, et cetera, I think there's a lot of human agency in there, which again relates to innovations of social organization, institutional innovations, and, and other choices that societies make. I'm really eager for both Peter and Peter and me to respond to this. I think I know what Peter's going to say. So I think we're going to deliver a one-two reply to you, Darren, to show that that 1%, we're, we agree on that 1% also. But uh, but uh, Peter, why don't you respond, Darren, and then I, and then, uh, and then I will. I'm fascinating, fascinated to know how how uh, this this diversity, basically, this inherent diversity in how cultures respond to their to their um, um, environments, which basically provides the raw material for selection. That's the variation component of a of a of a cultural evolutionary process. So, uh, Peter, take your turn. I'm dying to take mine. Oh no, I'm 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 basically a hundred percent in agreement with what uh, Darren has just said. So maybe maybe build on this a little bit. So we're talking about institutions. Uh, so what are um, institutions? Well, um, there are de different de definitions, but the one I like, it's a, it's a set system of rules, basically, that govern people's behaviors in certain situations, right? So for example, the institution of marriage, it tells uh, what are the roles of the husband, the wife, the children, who has uh, more power, who has less power. And also there could be some ways, to, uh, you typically, there's some ways to um, enforce uh, those rules. In terms of political institutions, uh, that's where uh, really things are becoming uh, very interesting. And so to add to what Darren said, I, I agree that there is a huge variety of, uh, of political institutions, specific arrangements that societies um, adopt to govern themselves. And uh, this is really not biological evolution. I mean, Yes, over the last 10,000 years, humans have evolved biologically. There's been genetic selection, you know that. But when we start talking about the organization of societies, it's really cultural evolution. So institution is, uh, is a cultural trait. So traits, what, what, what definition of traits? It means that there are at least two, typically more than uh, one value. And so that's why diversity of institutions is important is because there are many different types of institutions. And once you have uh, such a uh, very ideality, all right, now we know from Darwin's postulates that there is possibility of selection, assuming that there is also two other conditions, one of them inheritance. And we know that inheritance works with cultural evolution because you see a lot of continuity, even, you know, United States, uh, forming as a, uh, you know, as a colony of Great Britain has inherited quite a, a bunch of institutions uh, from them. So inheritance, inheritance is very important. And then um, uh, selection. Uh, so different institutions, and that's where it becomes very interesting. Different institutions are more or less successful. And this is now we're talking about the core of Darren's and, um, uh, and um, uh, the co-author's uh, book. Um, uh, that uh, it, it is, uh, the, it's really uh, human choices, individual choices are playing out within those institutions. 
And that's why institutions, different institutional um, uh, setups uh, have uh, been so influential in determining the fates of societies. So, so this means that you have all three uh, Darwin's postulates. And so that means that cultural evolution can proceed. And we've seen that. There's one, for example, one class of institutions is the, what we call the state. I mean, there are many different kinds of the states, but um, they're all characterized by having, let's say, pro professional bureaucracies. They have territory so that they uh, try to control, and they also try to create some internal peace uh, or other. So um, the states have arisen only in mid-Holocene, maybe five, 6,000 years ago, but they've taken over the earth. And this is an example of selection. So I think that uh, I'll stop here and let, uh, let uh, you know, Darren speak. Yeah, so if, if I can if I can add something because I think it's uh, it's complementary. I mean I think you brought it to very nicely to cultural evolution and and the multi level evolution that David already mentioned at the beginning. The way I think about it is that uh, you know absolutely completely that cultural evolution is a very good framework for thinking about these issues, but we should really sort of think about three levels of cultural evolution. One is individual. I think what values what social meaning individuals adopt. One is exactly group level, which you have emphasized already, Peter, and David's work is central. What is good for groups? You know, if, if your group is adopting some norms, some modes of behavior that are self-destructive, of course, it's gonna get disappear and be taken over by others. But then the third, which is implicit in your discussion, but I think is important to emphasize, is let's think of it as distributional, meaning that some of the norms and some of the institutions and some of the social meaning that we develop is because within a group it favors some actors sometimes at the expense of others so i think there are many different ways of thinking of transition to settled life and agriculture you know many people early on and still think of that as a great human achievement on the other hand if you look at the data exactly like you emphasize peter it looks like completely the opposite People started working harder, their calories fell, their statures worsened, their health worsened, uh, there was a lot less autonomy. So I think it's very difficult to make sense of it as a great achievement, at least in the quote unquote short run of about 8,000 years. But I think it makes much more sense once you start recognizing that, you know, some people benefited more than others from that. Uh, transition, you know, shamans, uh, religious elites that were emerging, and then political elites that were emerging slowly but surely. Uh, so, so the costs were not completely equally distributed, and 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 I, it's not about the group being successful. Uh, there is an element of that, but it's also some people within the group yeah. who have the power to uh, influence. <laughs> That's multi-level selection. Also, so welcome to multi-level selection. Exactly, it's multi-level, but I was emphasizing the three yeah, levels. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, absolutely. There's so much to talk about here, and so much, of course, to uh, integrate. Uh, I want to make a point, and here's where complexity comes in. That um, imagine that you take um, uh, this. I've done this as a biologist, so imagine that you assemble groups of organisms, and you vary the initial size of the groups. It might be two individuals. It might be it might be 2,000, it might be 2 million. Um, and then ask the question, you know, at what point do these groups vary? And sampling error tells you that the, the larger the initial size of the group, then the less variation there'll be among groups. But when those groups are complex systems, then something else happens. And that's something akin to sensitive dependence on initial conditions. Like the weather, small differences between those groups is going to become larger and larger and larger. And so complex systems have a way of becoming diverse, variable, based on this, based on this process. So now we're emphasizing the, uh, the inherent diversity, basically, of cultures, which we predict on the basis of complex systems theory should be scale independent, scale independent, no matter what the size of the society, we still expect this kind of butterfly effect that over time, leads to larger um, uh, differences. But then of course, some of these hang together and other fall apart. And so, and so basically you have this selection phase at various scales. And so when, when societies end up resembling each other, it's like it is convergent evolution. It's just the same way that many different species evolve hard shells. Um, 
many different societies evolve these functional attributes, they must, or else they'll they'll uh, fall apart. Now back to Tehard, and Tehard thought about human cultural evolution as a true uh, kind of phylogenetic group, like the birds, like the reptiles, like the mammals, like the dinosaurs. That's the way human cultures are. And, and I think we've really come to appreciate the wisdom of that, that although not so long ago, people thought of there being like a, a, a universal human nature, and then culture was kind of a thin veneer on a, on a universal human nature. A lot of evolutionary psychology reads like uh, reads like that, but now more and more we're realizing how much the way we are is thanks to cultural, how much cultural differences and diversity, how, how deep it runs, how deep it runs, all the way back to languages, for example, like there's no universal grammar, there's just language evolved on different parts of the earth, they're quite different from each other morphologically, and what they share in common are, are based on the functional demands on needing to communicate. And I think that here's where I think, Peter, you could talk briefly about the axial age because there's a case where the historians talked about this like phase of human history. Um, and what you're retelling of that, or Seishat's retelling of that, is much more of this um, separate, loosely linked, but separate developments in the, in the, in the evolution of the scale of, of society which were cases of convergent cultural evolution. So let's spend a little bit of time on the, on the axial age, and then we'll transition to the present. And actually, I would like to start uh, to pick up where Darren uh, left um, uh, this topic. So we're talking about who, who benefits. Obviously, in hugely unequal societies, there is a small elite, you know, the proverbial 1% who um, who uh, benefit from uh, inequality, and the 99% uh, are uh, the sufferers. So, um, so at the, uh, and let's think about uh, this uh, early complex societies. They um, uh, arose uh, pretty much as a result of conflict between uh, apologies between uh, political organizations. And so that's why it was natural that military leaders uh, buttressed by their uh, retinue would uh, be able to grab a lot of uh, power. And so at that level, um, you know, um, a military leader, the king or the chief, uh, would be able to coerce everybody else because they're organized, uh, they're well armed, they're well trained and so on and so forth. So at the level of within group selection, we should see more and more um, inequality in egalitarianism and, uh, you know, uh, arise. But let's not forget that this society that we are looking at is, does not live in isolation. There are other societies around it. And it turns out that those societies which are more egalitarian, they still could be unequal, but they're not quite as despotic as uh, the one that we are looking at. They actually turn out to do well, to, to do better at, um, at the business of war. And so that's one of the common ways that uh, despots actually uh, are deposed, is they're deposed by, uh, by losing their war and uh, together with their own, uh, you know, um, uh, their people, unfortunately, oftentimes. So what we have here, we have the two forces of evolution uh, acting in opposite direction within the groups. We, uh, we, we see a force favoring more and more in egalitarianism. And by the way, uh, this is what, uh, um, let's say, uh, Thomas Piketty uh, uh, picked upon. In the absence of that external competition, what we see is that uh, inequality will keep uh, growing and more and more and more until the, the society basically collapses under uh, its, uh, uh, because it's so hugely unequal. But what happens is that societies don't live uh, in isolation of each other. And so there is a natural uh, evolutionary process that uh, leads out those uh, the dysfunctional um, despotic uh, societies. And so, um, so to the, uh, back to the, uh, your, your question, David, now I'm prepared to answer it. What happened uh, during the Axial Age? So first of all, what's Axial Age? Axial Age is the first millennium BC, all right? So we are the key um, period is typically 800 BC to 200 BC. That's when a lot of 
um, um, new uh, religions, world religions arose, or uh, uh, philosophers, and so on and so forth. But what we have, we have actually a paper that's, uh, 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 that is out in preprint and, and it has been submitted to the journal. It turns out that we can actually document what happened. And, and this, the story is quite neat. I will obviously simplify as hell. But around 1000 BC, uh, nomadic uh, uh, herders living north of the Black Sea and Caspian Sea, they figured out how to control horses. Uh, so they use the bits and bridle. And so suddenly we see like thousands of metal bits just show up and spread through the Great Steppe and uh, farming societies living south of it. So uh, this was the start, beginning of cavalry. Uh, they uh, combined horse riding with um, iron metallurgy so that the arrows uh, were tipped with iron and also compound, um, um, uh, composite, excuse me, bows, which um, have been actually known for thousands of years. So they created a weapon of mass destruction and put a lot of the farming societies south of the steppe under really this existential threat. So there was, there was a huge um, uptick in the intensity of warfare and those societies had to do something or, uh, or go under. And they did a variety of things. First of all, they started building big armies of infantrymen because they could not get enough horses. They uh, uh, came up with new ways of armor. So uh, hoplite armor, hoplite, hoplite panoply is the actually was invented uh, during this time. They uh, came up with new, uh, you know, uh, crossbows, you know, and, but most importantly, they scaled up. They scaled up and, and then we see huge uh, empires such as the first one is the Persian, the Achaemenid uh, Persian Empire, but it was uh, quickly followed by the Roman Empire, by Han, Han Dynasty in uh, China, uh, by Mo Moria, uh, Mauryan Empire in North India, and so on and so forth. These were huge empires. They had tens of millions of people, um, uh, millions of square kilometers of terrain, and new institutions such as new religions that would allow them to integrate. And here's those, where the uh, diversity comes in. Basically, Christianity, Buddhism, Confucianism, these were different solutions, basically, to the same problem, each providing... Well, route. Christianity is an offshoot of um, uh, Middle Eastern uh, monotheism. So Middle Eastern yeah. monotheism arose uh, first uh, in the middle of the first millennium BC. Christianity and Islam followed with some uh, uh, timeline. So if I if I could, you know, I think uh, uh, Peter gave an excellent account of the Axial Age. I mean, I uh, I completely agree. I just want to underscore what David said, uh, and then perhaps uh, disagree with one little thing that Peter emphasized, which I think is actually not unimportant. You know, the first one is I think Peter. My my reading agrees completely with Peter's that there were common shocks that especially took the form of changes in military threats and military technology preceding the Axial Age. But exactly like David emphasizes, I think the solutions that different societies developed are quite distinct. Yes, there is some commonality that they're all trying to sort of regulate conflict, but the way that, say, uh, ancient Athenians are regulating conflict is completely different from the ones of the Israelites. And that's in turn is very, very different from Confucius and, uh, and, and the legalism that followed it. So I think that diversity is super important. And precisely because of that diversity, I disagree with one part of what Peter said, which is this inequality dynamics that somehow societies left to their own devices will increase inequality and that uh, external conflict sometimes is a limit on, on, on that inequality. I think that's also quite contingent. First of all, my reading is that the early phase of the conflict between uh, settled agriculturalists and hunter-gatherers went the way of the unequal ones because of their population. Agriculturalists were much better at uh, obliterating the hunter-gatherers from many parts of the world. And that was a huge boost to inequality, of course. Uh, but second, I think many societies came up with different ways of limiting that conflict. Some of them more, I mean, none of those are perfect equal societies, but the Athenian solution, despite the fact that it was based on slavery in that, in that, in that polity, was still much more egalitarian than the solution that the Persians came up with or the Israelites came up with, at least at first. So, so I think there are ways in which institutional adaptations can uh, 
put a brake on inequality. And there's a good reason sometimes for that, because inequality is also very destabilizing. I mean, the way that the Athenian polity or the Greek uh, societies illustrate is that the Dark Ages and the aftermath of the Dark Ages were very high in conflict because of the birth pains of a new elite and what they're trying to do with land and how they were marginalizing a lot of uh, uh, the regular people. And many of the institutional adaptations from Solon to Cleisthenes were actually ways of trying to control that, which ultimately meant reducing inequality. So I am actually quite uh, open to the idea. I think it's that sometimes we are going to find good, good institutions that can create stability and put a limit to inequality, but then those are not going to be universal either. As the scale of society grows, or the nature of the assets grow, change, some of those institutions are no longer going to be feasible. So we need yet more institutional innovations. Actually, I don't think we, dis we are disagreeing that much, because uh, I also agree with you that it's internal uh, uh, checks on uh, on despotic individuals that are very important. I'm just saying that it is the interpolity competition. It doesn't have to be warfare, but it could be competition for uh, in other ways. That's really what disciplines the elites uh, within uh, the society, which who typically have enough power to control the population and uh, continue accumulating power uh, internally. So, but it's it's an empirical question. Uh, it would be very interesting. In fact, this is what something that we are doing. We are trying to collect data. To, to resolve precisely this question. When we see uh, uh, a new more egalitarian institutions or more fair institutions arise, what are the conditions uh, what, uh, the, under which they arise? I mean, the nature of the, 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 the technology, military technology matters a lot. You know, during the colonial period, for example, I think uh, some of the uh, warfare really favored the elites because it really enriched them and it, it really required further uh, uh, further military investments, but there are then other periods during which uh, we see exactly uh, more egalitarian tribes or bands bringing down empires. Uh, so, so, so I think it really does depend on the nature of the military technology as well. Remember that Athens was not living there in isolation. There was intense warfare. In fact, there was warfare uh, pretty much every year. All right, and so that was the period when uh, intense warfare between uh, polis was actually um, uh, driving the uh, democracy within them, uh, because in order uh, the way to win in this war was to put a lot of hoplites uh, into into the field, and uh, and the way you did that it was by giving them uh, a say in uh, in the government, and that's uh, that. Uh, so to me, I draw that causal connection. Yeah, this dynamic plays itself out on, uh, yeah, on all these scales. I want to introduce the, first of all, we're going to segue to the present real fast here, but back to complexity. The idea of attractors, basically, basins of attraction, um, are regimes that are stable, and they themselves vary. You could have, a, uh, you could have a, um, an egalitarian regime, or you could have a despotic regime. Uh, the thing about regimes is their stability. And so it's if you have a stable egalitarian regime, to some extent, it does resist being corrupted by uh, various forms of various forms of uh, uh, selfishness and so on. Although I would I think that that corrupting influence actually is probably true in every society. But uh, but I think the idea of, of um, selecting among uh, local equilibria, basically, or basins of attraction, equilibrium selection, they sometimes call it, is, is, um, is an important, uh, is an important uh, refinement of this idea of multi-level selection. So it's not the case that, that um, egalitarian regimes are always vulnerable to, to um, um, exploitation. Well, now let's, let's do what I've been saying. You know, if we, go, if we focus on the present, the roughly 200 nations that now carve up the planet. It's really basically the current edge of cultural multi-level selection. And you, Darren, are, that's what you do. And Peter, also what you do, for example, with your great book, Ages of Discord, your, uh, your um, uh, uh, analysis of, of American history. 
And Darren, you make this fundamental distinction between inclusive and extractive regimes. And maybe you could, which I think is just continuous to everything we've been saying, but if you could just take it from there and outline your outline your theory about why nations fail and why they why they succeed, then uh, that will uh, begin us on our on our uh, discussion of the present. Yeah, I think it very much builds on what we talked about. Uh, as Peter said, you know, when you go back in history during times of very different military technology and very different types of states. Uh, there is a there there is a continuous process of interpolity competition, uh, and the nature of technology is different. That's going to generate a bunch of dynamics uh, depending on who has the greater ability to cooperate with other nations, trade with them versus take them over, and so on. But today we live in the age of industrial technology, and I think a critical aspect of both domestic economy and politics and international relations is how you leverage and develop that industrial technology. It, there is pretty much no society on earth right now that has not been touched by that technology now. And, and the idea of the inclusive economic institutions is that by providing opportunities and incentives for a broad cross-section of society, rather than just sidelining them, it's going to be much better at developing and exploiting that technology. In contrast, what we call extractive economic institutions are going to monopolize economic opportunities in the hands of a very small group and are not going to use the talents and the different approaches and the diversity, again, back to diversity, the diversity of their of their populations. And we're talking of nation states here. So all of them have you know large populations. So using that diversity, that collective knowledge, going back to the issues of uh, the multi-level selection, I think a lot of industrial technology is just the fruit of the collective knowledge of humans. And how do we develop them? That's going to depend on how how well we deploy that collective knowledge. And of course, once you start thinking about this this way, you see it cannot be separated from politics. Inclusive economic institutions that provide opportunities and incentives for a broad set of people, well, they need to be supported by particular types of political institutions. And if you're going to have systems that create an economic elite that monopolizes everything, well, that needs to be supported by a political uh, by a set of political arrangements that's going to empower them politically as well. And that's, that's, that's all about the co-evolution of economic and political institutions. So those were the ideas uh, James Robinson and I developed in Why Nations Fail. In our more recent book, The Narrow Corridor, uh, we've sort of built on this and, and, and thought much more about the uh, the evolution of these political and economic institutions. And again, it comes back to the same themes that we are discussing here. For example, how do you balance state power versus societal power? You know, if you build your institutions, for instance, as many of the archaic empires started doing and many of the uh, European uh, uh, states of the Middle uh, Middle Ages and beyond, or uh, or the Chinese tradition of state building from the Qin Dynasty onward, that's going to empower the state and sideline bottom-up participation. On the other hand, we see different models, uh, for example, like those that evolved after the collapse of the Roman Empire in 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 parts of Europe which fused uh, the more egalitarian ethos and institutions, assemblies of the Germanic tribes, such as the Franks, together with some aspects of state institutions from Roman Empire, then you will get a different set of institutions. And then, you know, of course, the egalitarian impulse is there, even though no society is like the foraging ones. Uh, you, will, you will see many examples where the same sort of uh, norms of undercutting hierarchy are going to emerge. It's actually sort of interesting that the person who's made some of a very interesting contribution to this area is also Christopher Bohm, uh, when he studied the, uh, the Balkans and the Montenegrin uh, the societies and showing how they were undercutting 
any type of hierarchy and state institutions uh, repeatedly, I think it's no surprise that uh, we see a version of reverse dominance hierarchy. But I think this is where the institutions and diversity and conditions changing becomes important. The reverse dominance hierarchies that humans were so amazing at building and maintaining for, you know, a million and a half years, perhaps, well, at least 200,000 years. You know, they're not going to work when you're looking at large scale societies. So you need different institutions if you're going to be able to build an egalitarian society or at least quasi-egalitarian society. So that's where modern democracy, I think, becomes part of the picture. And, and modern is important. You know, of course, the Athenian democracy is great. It's inspiring and it's amazing to study, but it's not going to work in a large scale society either. It was exploiting the fact that, that Athens was a small polity, only men and citizens who are I mean non-slaves were able to participate in politics so you could have a lot of direct democracy that's not going to work today so how are you going to build those institutions to deal with the problems that we confront today without sort of empowering just a particular very narrow hierarchy i think those are some of the issues and they have huge consequences both for equality and how we actually use industrial technology and moving to the future part of it how we use for example New digital technologies, including artificial intelligence, I think those questions cannot be separated from the hierarchies we build and hierarchies we limit. So let's zoom in on America. And uh, let me start it off with uh, Darren's account in Why Nations Fail. One of my favorite stories is that when Jamestown was founded, the colony of Jamestown was founded, the first of the intention was just to conquer the Indians the way the, the, way the Spaniards and Portuguese did and rule over the Indians. That didn't work. Their next step was to try to recreate a, a feudal European society by importing laborers and housing them in barracks under threat of death. That didn't work. And so they were forced by circumstances to become more egalitarian, forced by circumstances. So some cultural evolution took place there big time. Absolutely. I think I think that's actually a really, really good story. And the way you told it is perfect, David. Essentially, you know, the Brits, I mean, the English, they weren't British at the time. The English just wanted to repeat what the Spanish did. They wanted to go there and dominate and exploit the local population. And they go there and there's no local population to exploit. The population density is extremely small and the native population is running away and not cooperating with them. And suddenly those guys find themselves at the bottom of the hierarchy. And, and that's the view that the Jamestown colony had. You know, they, okay, fine, we cannot exploit the Indians, so we're going to exploit these uh, uh, indentured servants and the, and the settlers who came there with, uh, with, the, with, the, with the promise that they're going to build a better life. Now they're going to find themselves under even harsher conditions. But that's where the egalitarian ethos kicks in. They say, no, we're not going to put up with it. And they revolt against it. They revolt by walking out and uh, fleeing. The open frontier helps. Uh, they they voice their concerns, and there is a protracted struggle. But ultimately, uh, they 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 they, uh, uh, they they are victorious. But it also c defines the character of American democracy for the next 300, 400 years. That this was rights for the European settlers. They never wanted rights for the Native Americans. They still wanted to exploit them. And later when the uh, slaves were imported, they... That made them similar to Greek democracy in that regard. And... and, uh, and... Exactly. Even more extreme, but yes. Yeah, similar, and yes. so, and then another thing you say is that because the Spaniards and Portuguese could, could find societies that were already hierarchical and basically just chop the head off of those, then ever since, ever since... Nations in 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 Central and South America have been crippled basically by some kind of deep cultural structure that makes it difficult to be egalitarian. Absolutely. That's that's the absolutely deep, cultural, deep political. Cultural but again, but it's but but I'll emphasizing that again, history here is not destiny. You also see a lot of variation. You know uh, that history that you very aptly summarized is completely common to Guatemala and Costa Rica. They were, in fact, part of the Guatemalan yep, yep, kingdom. Yep, yep. But then they separate and Costa Rica becomes much more egalitarian, much less unequal in terms of the organization of agriculture. And of course, for the leader in terms of democracy and political participation in Latin America. So, so again, showing that there are different ways of 
so finding solutions to this large scale cooperation and economic production problem. History is not destiny. Cultural evolution continues. But now I want to uh, uh, segue to you, Peter. You are credited with having predicted our current unrest. And so outline for us the thesis of your book, Ages of Discord, and the fact that actually uh, America, which we've just been discussing, has, has cycled not once but twice between the extremes of extractive and, and inclusive. First, um, let me just say that uh, uh, I agree with Darren um, very much about the nature of competition between societies today. And this is uh, actually a very hopeful sign because uh, warfare is not the only way that societies can compete. Societies now, uh, it's not, we have not made a complete transition to this, but uh, modern states actually compete in providing um, the, um, the well-being to their citizens. Yeah, I grew up in the Soviet Union, a country which does not exist anymore. And the reason it does not exist anymore is not because uh, it, it lost a war, it was conquered or anything. It lost uh, the, uh, uh, the support of its uh, citizens and the and elites. And uh, as a result, there was a very substantial institutional change internally within uh, the country, uh, which was, uh, much of it was um, uh, selective um, um, uh, um, uh, copying of institutions, but also adopting them to the uh, local uh, environments. And now um, um, this type of, uh, and, and this type of uh, uh, um, desire by citizens to, for better life, has been expressed, for example, very clearly during the Arab Spring, because many of the people demonstrating in Tahrir or uh, elsewhere, they were basically uh, blaming their governments for mismanaging uh, politics, economy, everything, essentially, and not delivering the better, a better uh, quality of life. And uh, this actually uh, type of, we see this uh, type of pressure working even 100 years ago. So here and now we get to the United States. Um, during the New Deal, Roosevelt administration felt under strong uh, competitive pressure from uh, the totalitarian uh, alternatives, including both Nazi Germany and uh, the communist Russia. And in fact, they sent uh, 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 researchers to look into how, you know, uh, in Russia, for example, uh, the state, uh, uh, you know, tries to make uh, the life of workers better, what, you know, uh, Nazis are doing and things like that. And they, in fact, as I understand, they even copied some of those uh, things, not wholesale, of course, but they were trying to learn from those experiences. Certainly, um, I would uh, say that the, the, one of the reason that we had this great, uh, you know, uh, convergence in uh, the, um, uh, in, in um, uh, uh, incomes and uh, wealth in the United States was because of the competition specifically with uh, communist Russia. Uh, uh, so it, it was one of the important elements. And so um, that basically, that and the uh, and experience of World War II, they um, essentially impressed on the political leadership of this country the need to uh, for cooperation, cooperation uh, broadly stated between the state, between the government uh, agents, between the uh, capitalists or you know uh, employees, employers, and workers or employees. So in fact, it's kind of interesting. But the United States uh, was a Nordic country uh, until about the 1960s. For between 1930s and 1960s, there was an implicit and unwritten contract, uh, which is tripartite contra contract between the state, uh, the business owners, and workers. And until that unwritten contract held, um, uh, the um, the um, uh, uh, the, the society was quite uh, quite functional. I mean, there were all kinds of inequalities. Obviously, um, the uh, the race uh, issue was uh, very important and not solved during this time. But um, uh, at the same time, when we look at the median um, uh, uh, workers, for example, their um, well being, economic well being, their wages were increasing at the rate of the overall economy. 
and at the same time, the big, uh, the, if you look at the, what was happening, the big fortunes, they were disappearing. All right. And then uh, we came to a turnaround point of 1970s, and that's uh, when uh, the whole uh, dynamic uh, started going in reverse. And part of the reason is because the new generation of leaders came, they, they were much more selfish. They, uh, did, they assumed that uh, uh, the two generations of stability and uh, function and function that they saw is just automatic. Uh, and they started dismantling this, uh, uh, this uh, unwritten contract and as a result of that, uh, from the 1980s or so, you see a huge explosion of inequality. And this inequality is not just a relative thing. Um, as uh, Paul Krugman wrote recently um, in a column, the real wages of the median workers are actually lower than they were 40 years ago, slightly lower than they were 40 years ago, despite the huge increase of uh, economy overall and also a huge increase of the uh, um, the productivity of the American worker. So, so here we are. So we are talking really about what uh, uh, Darren and James uh, wrote uh, in their book, but now we're taking a very dynamical approach to it. Yeah, so if I cannot, yeah, that, I, mean, I think that's a great uh, account that Peter gave. Uh, and if I could add just two things, and then perhaps this is also a segue to the future. Uh, uh, I think uh, Peter is absolutely right that competition was very important. I think the best examples of that are actually South Korea and Taiwan. Both of those success stories, I think, are uh, uh, cannot be understood without the threat from North Korea or mainland China. I mean, in Taiwan, Kuomintang, which was really a, a completely parasitic institution when it was in China becomes a developmental state in Taiwan. And social democracy, I think, cannot be understood without uh, uh, without the threat of communism from Soviet Russia. However, I think we also see the role of institutional innovations, ideas, institutional adaptations that depend on power dynamics and other things. You know, uh, the welfare state as any other institution had its problems. And a group of thinkers led by economists such as Milton Friedman really changed the tenor of how we should approach some of these problems starting in the 1970s. And I think without that institutional responses to the inefficiencies of the welfare state, we cannot understand how uh, the uh, way that market economies in especially anglo-saxon countries are uh, are functioning today or have, have been transformed globalization technology have played a role too but but really we have also changed how we are structuring these market economies so i i think peter is absolutely right but it's not just external threats the berlin walls fall i think is important but these internal dynamics are are important as well and segueing into the future i think uh, you know, it's hard to imagine, but somehow the Cold War, exactly like Peter said, brought up some of the more cohesive elements in some communities. But I don't see any evidence of that happening because of competition against China. It seems to bring out the worst instincts of each political group and each economic interest grouping. So one question moving into the future, especially as we are confronted with some of the most defining global challenges, such as climate change, pandemics, dealing with inequalities and new technologies, including automation. I, I'm not sure how the competition between China and the US is going to shape these things, but it's hard to be completely optimistic. Well, one possibility that the United States will fragment uh, and not be something to compare to, and uh, uh, whatever arises after that, uh, we'll learn from those experiences. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, certainly chi China, uh, I mean, we have the Washington consensus and Beijing consensus. There are two different ways of um, organizing um, um, uh, states. And unfortunately, China has shown itself to be a more functional state, especially in the last couple of years. 
uh, looking at their um, dealing. But, you know, I mean, if you think of Beijing consensus versus Washington consensus, the gap is much smaller than that existed between yeah. the Soviet consensus and the Washington consensus or whatever American approach, Marshall Plan, whatever it, you're going to call it. So, so in some sense, one would might have thought ex ante that there would be more room for cooperation, and but but perhaps that's not. Although true. No, you should not uh, uh, overestimate the communism in in the Soviet Union. I grew up. It's basically like communism. Is, the Soviet Union was one uh, big firm that, that was controlled by the party. It was so. Uh, as a result of that, there was no internal competition, which is very important, as you know, between firms, and that was one of the big reasons why. It didn't work so well. So it was more state capitalism than uh, communism as envisioned by Karl Marx, for example. So let's have you both try to be as optimistic as you can in terms of how we work our way towards some kind of global governance worth wanting. Um, and, um, and then let's actually be not as pessimistic as you can, but really outline some of the scenarios. You know, if that doesn't happen, what's in store for us? Because this idea that the Noah sphere is coming, there's any kind of inevitability to it, uh, please no. And we really need to have, I think, the the scary story in addition to the to the optimistic story. So let's begin on the optimistic side. Uh, what's uh, how can? Well, I mean, I think I think you have to weave in the optimism and the okay. pessimism okay. because I think That's they're fine. they're inseparable in my okay. mind. So, I mean, you know, uh, I think on the optimistic side, of course, new technologies have the promise of improving our productivity, improving our health, uh, eliminating the more unpleasant, dangerous, physically uh, uh, unhealthy jobs. Of course, we can, we have the capability to deal with the climate change crisis. We've already made amazing improvements in renewable technologies. I'm not, I don't think, I don't give any stock to ideas of super intelligence and uh, galactic travel and things like that. I think those really are Silicon Valley fantasies. So I'm not going to uh, even go there. But but I think there are there is the technological capabilities to be optimistic. On the other hand, I think if you look at the politics and the institutional framework i don't see any way but be pessimistic i don't think we are up to the challenge of dealing with climate change despite the fact that you know just a minimal amount of intervention has led to tremendous progress in renewable energy today renewable energy is co competitive or in fact for according to some calculations cheaper than fossil fuel based energy but without global cooperation between china india uh, and the us as well as brazil and uh, other large countries europe I don't see how we can deal with the climate change challenge. And even worse, I think even though digital technologies have the promise to bring improved welfare, I think right now they are tools in the hands of large companies and governments to suppress people, to automate jobs in a way that's really unequalizing. I think that is a very, very, my, my research suggests, Peter, that is the driver of a lot of the facts that you mentioned. like. Uh, median wages being stagnant or about 50% of Americans actually experiencing real wage declines. And, and and of course, the huge amount of data and power in the hands of companies and governments, I think, is creating a completely different politics today than what we have been used to for the last hundreds of years. So I, I don't think we are aware. We don't have the, if you want to call it, wisdom as a population to actually try to even confront these challenges you know there is a bit of uh grumbling right now about facebook but i think it's not systemic enough uh in recognizing how the power of these companies has multiplied and perhaps become inconsistent with democratic institutions i think those are the things that make me really pessimistic as well as the climate change challenge of course yeah i'm i'm by nature an optimist uh, but uh, my optimism has to go, it has to be long term. So uh, in the short run, realistically, we are in for a rough decade, especially here in the United States and, and partly in Western Europe. And because um, the, our current leadership is still too busy fighting uh, each other, different factions fighting each other, rather than trying to address the core issues. 
But in the core issue, which seems uh, lying to lie on the uh, surface, is that we have to reverse that decline of the uh, of the common pe uh, people in, in the United States. All right, uh, it's uh, hugely unfair because why should uh, the majority of the population slide? Uh, down one uh, when uh, the economy is increasing and 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 we have all these wonderful technologies as Darren uh, mentioned. So until this idea actually penetrates uh, the um, political leadership, I mean Democrats may be a little bit better, but I don't see um, uh, Biden administration uh, is not doing anything about let's say increasing the minimum wage. All right, uh, so that's uh, that's the one very clear intervention. It, it's not enough, obviously, but. That would send a signal and also would uh, improve the lives of primarily, by the way, um, African Americans who are the ones who would uh, benefit from this. Um, so they're not doing that. Um, and um, uh, so I'm afraid that uh, we, we, you'll have to run the course of this uh, uh, age of discord, as I called it. However, the optimism is that usually, first of all, there are two sources of, of optimism. First of all, ages of discord end. Um, and uh, oftentimes in a violent manner, but uh, uh, after that, a new age of prosperity does come uh, because there is this dynamics. Are, the dynamics are setting good times breed bad times, but bad times good uh, breed uh, good times. So it's really a, a dynamical system here, not cycles, but uh, but uh, dynamics. Um, secondly, second source of optimism that we have now collected. A lot of data on previous crises going back uh, thousands of years. And so uh, we don't have yet statistics, but it's pretty clear that humans are learning something. The institutions that we have uh, been uh, creating and layering over over the past thousands of years, they start to work better and better. As a result, the collapses are less uh, likely. Uh, they are also less severe. And the periods of interregna after the, you know, breakdown, uh, social breakdown, they're shorter. So that means that maybe we are starting to learn uh, more how to deal with such uh, crisis. So, and that's my second uh, source of optimism. Well, let me end with my source of uh, optimism, which is actually quite Tehardian. And when I had my conversation with Josh Ober about Greek democracy, and when I read his work, I was amazed by how deliberative the construction of Greek democracy was. I mean, the Athenians were just, it was their explicit goal to make a democracy, complete with its institutions and its processes and its deems and its tribes. And it's just amazing the degree to which they were engaged in a process of conscious cultural evolution. And yes, there were the vagaries of history and all that, but the the degree of consciousness that was on display in the invention of Greek democracy, and I think this is true in other cases, was amazing to me. And, and that included the institution uh, building. And if we now actually become similarly conscious, but now we appreciate the scale that democracy needs to take place, namely the global scale, but if that actually became our conceptual, our paradigm, basically, if there was any kind of agreement among any kind of core of people, that it's the whole earth that requires good governance, and here's how we need to go about doing it, then that, first of all, that objective, getting that right, and that, in, that involves just eliminating the concept of the invisible hand as a profound untruth, that you don't just set about maximizing lower level goals, and then the invisible hand makes it all good at the higher scale? Absolutely not. We must have the highest scale in mind. And then everything under that remains important, but, but requires coordination. If that became the worldview, if that became the worldview, then we would be working towards effective solutions, which actually are at hand. So that's my optimism, but it requires a conceptual sea change. And, and I think some of us have it. But but do, I mean it's I think it's I think it's it's completely agree with you David that that would be a very laudable goal but it seems like we are going in the opposite direction today nationalism is much stronger than it was twenty years ago mm -hmm. uh, and you know there are reasons for that it's imperfectly understood but certainly related to globalization inequalities instabilities insecurities but but I think when 
when we are unable to build institutions that actually foster yeah. this sort of global cooperation, I, I think it will only get worse. And climate change is as good a challenge for us to do that. And we are we have completely failed. Well, perhaps the glass is half full you know, or half empty. Glass is half full. Yeah, yeah. And also, I think institutions, quarter, quarter. <laughs> institutions can be the following event, not the leading event that often I think, you know, you, you know better than I do that the first thing that happens is some, you know, groundswell and then institutions are built on the basis of that. So it's not as if it's absolutely, not- absolutely. That, and that groundswell was there, I think, in the after the fall of the Berlin Wall, there was a euphoria, at, you know, not every, among everybody, but among some class of people multinationally uh, or around the world, there was that euphoria. But now it has sort of the, the, the pendulum has swung yep. backwards. I mean, yep. if you look at if you go to developing countries, the amount of nationalism has, is, is completely uncomparable to what it was what was visible, you know, 20 years yeah. ago. And I think that's the dynamic is, is, is quite concerning about exactly those challenges that you're pointing yeah. out. Well, I think that this yeah. is the, but the, the turbulence, the turbulence and dysfunction that you see ahead of us is also going to be uh, a factor. Historically, it had been, has been a factor in uh, creating, adopting new institutions and things like that. Think about, you know, the glorious revolution, revolution in England that followed uh, 40 years of civil wars and all kinds of uh, nastiness, all right? So, so that's, where, that's why uh, optimism and pessimism have to, have to be, you know, somehow in a dynamical, um, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. equilibrium between themselves. Dynamical, like okay, this, this conversation has been dynamical to the end. And so this has been uh, so great, everyone, uh, um, uh, Darren and, and Peter, so happy to have had it and to have captured it for... Um, widespread distribution. So thank you so much.